I'm Russ Altman, and this is the future of everything. Today, the future of crypto genomics. There's a revolution in the use of DNA data these days. People are using it for genetic research to understand the causes of disease and to evaluate the patient's risk for disease, to figure out if patients are going to respond to drugs, and to find about ancestry. Who are you related to and where did your people come from way back when? There are large biobanks that have been created by researchers to support genetic research. And in these situations, participants sign up to give their medical data as well as their genome DNA data so that researchers can figure out which DNA leads to which kind of health consequences. There's one in the UK called the UK Biobank, which has 500,000 participants. And there's a newer one in the US called All of Us, which aims to have a million participants. That'll allow us to decide how to best discover disease causes uh, in genetics over the next several years. Sometimes DNA is used from patient samples where the names and all other identifying information about those patients is removed so that you can use the DNA without any risk to the patients or at least hardly any risk because their identifying information has been removed. Now, DNA can also be used for tracking criminals. You have 50% of your DNA shared with your parents, your siblings, and your children. You have 25% of your DNA shared with your uncles and aunts and with your grandchildren. And as relatives become more and more distant, you have less and less DNA shared with them, but still a measurable amount so that DNA samples can be used to figure out if two people are related. And because of that, DNA can be used to implicate people in crimes. If the authorities have the DNA of a, of a, of a criminal, and if they have the DNA of one of those criminals' relatives, they can make that connection and say, okay, some relative of this person committed this crime. And if the other facts of the case all add up, that criminal could be in trouble. This happened in the Golden Gate Killer case, where the Golden Gate Killer's DNA was not in any database, except for the police had it from the crime scene, but the police were able to find relatives in the database that were available that allowed them to make the connection from those relatives to the suspect. And then when they got a sample from the suspect, it matched the crime scene and the Golden Gate killer was in trouble. So this raises concerns about privacy. Researchers try hard to protect the DNA of their subjects, but you can never account entirely for a bad egg researcher or a nefarious third party who just wants to cause trouble and take the DNA and use it to perhaps discriminate against uh, individuals based on their genetics, or just to get on the cover of the New York Times saying, I stole DNA, and therefore nobody should ever participate in genetic research. So there is definitely a risk of DNA being used against the wishes of people who otherwise want to be helpful. Now, I spoke with Gil Bejarano. He's a professor of developmental biology, computer science, pediatrics, and data science at Stanford University, and we talked about these issues. He's published a method for analyzing the DNA of large numbers of patients, and this method doesn't require the researchers to have all the DNA in their database. Instead, it's kind of on a need-to-know basis so that the researchers can still do their research, but they never have to store and hold all the data and therefore put it at risk of being broken in by a bad, by a bad guy. I first asked Gil why, after working on genetic discovery for so many years, he turned his attention to this new idea of combining, combining cryptography with genetics in a new field that he's calling, and others call, cryptogenomics. So Gil, thanks for being with us. And uh, you've been a genomic researcher for, for quite a while now, looking at the basic biology of health and the basic biology of, of life itself. What would draw you to this topic of genetic privacy after really focusing on discovery in genetics for so many years? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Russ. I think what really drew me into, into uh, what we call the cryptogenomic um, field was a very fortuitous um, talk that I actually attended. So, so, you know, one of my affiliations is with the Stanford Computer Science Department, and I was privileged to sit in a talk that Dan Bonet gave, one of my colleagues gave, to the faculty in computer science. And he was teaching us about recent events in cryptography. And he was telling us how in cryptography, you know, they are able now to perform very complicated comp computations without ever sharing the inputs. 
So you can find, the, you and I can find the output together without you ever sharing your input with me and me ever sharing my input with you. And that was like a moment where a light bulb went in my head. I was like, oh my God, you know, Dan is like talking to me about genomics. This is how genomics should be done. This is how we can solve a lot of issues in genomic privacy. So I was super excited, Russ. I grabbed a, a napkin. It was like a, at a hotel. <laughs> I grabbed a napkin. I was like, okay, how do I tell Dan what I want to ask him? So I thought like I simmered it down for like a half hour of, of his conversation to like three lines of math. And then at the end of the talk, I rushed over and I was like, Dan, Dan, can you do this? I put the napkin in front of him. And Dan looks at this and says, yeah, I think we can. So, so that's okay. how I got into, into So, so, so that, that is a great story. And so let's go back. What were the problems that you were aware of that Dan's technologies looked like a potential solution for? Absolutely. So, so the magic, you know, the, the way genomics and cryptography magically fit together us is because we can only understand genomes in the context of comparing them to each other. So we will take the genomes of healthy people and, for example, the genomes of unrelated individuals that seem to suffer from the same disease, and we ask, do all these individuals who seem to suffer maybe from the same disease have anything in common that nobody else who's healthy doesn't have that? And we would find, you know, the cause of a novel disease, right? We've right. done that as a community multiple times. But every time you do that, you have to share information between between people, between patients. You have to share information across hospital silos sometimes, right? Because the yes. bigger the data set you work with. So, so when and it's easy to it, forget, you know, I, I just say, it's easy to forget that these are real people who have, in some cases, uh, donated their uh, DNA to research uh, knowingly. And in other cases, it's been de-identified. But in all cases, they're doing a huge uh, service to society by letting us use their uh, genetic information for discovery. Absolutely. So, so when Dan said, look, you know, we can let as many people as you like, you know, depending on the efficiency of the computation, put their inputs into the game without ever sharing them. So we could ask the exact same questions, solve the exact same problems without ever sharing genomes between us. And yeah. then maybe I should mention another thing else that's, that's magic in genomics. You have to share billions of data points in order to sometimes get insights that are focused on two, three places in the genome. Right. So if you never share the three billion data points that tell you all kinds of things about me, right? All kinds of unrelated things to the problem, and you can still perform the exact same computation and find the two data and share only the two data points that yeah. you and I would love to share to improve our state, to improve the, the state of understanding for humanity. That seemed like a match made in heaven. And so previously when scientists did this, basically we had to trust that they were just going to focus on the thing that they're interested in, like heart disease or a ch childhood disease, and that they weren't going to look at all the other parts of your DNA where they could learn things about you that are irrelevant to their research, but like maybe they were just interested to find out. And that's a source of worry that you're, you're asking, you know, in general, we trust researchers, but on the other hand, there's a lot of researchers, there's a lot of DNA, people break into systems. And so the worry there is that somebody along the way is not going to have these noble purpose and might use the DNA in ways that it really wasn't meant to be used. Absolutely. So, so that's one goal. And then as we kept thinking about it more or less, you know, we also realized that was the first goal, absolutely, that there's also these silos, right? So the silos are mandated by law, right? A hospital ah. has to keep my data as private as it possibly can. But then we started asking ourselves, look, you know, these computations, you can do them across silos without ever breaking what the hospital has promised me. They will do a computation with another hospital. Right. If they think my data could be useful, they could notify my doctors who could notify me if I could be in, if I wanted to be in or not. Yes. And they never, you know, I'm not a lawyer, right? but as far as I can see it as a, as an, as a scientist um, and an engineer, we never share my data. Right. We never share my input. So, so because I of that legal barrier. So now you're going to poke exactly. a hole. So tell me, this does sound like magic. So can you tell it in, in for the everyday person, what's the key idea where I can do a, my hospital can share data with another hospital to do a, com a combined computation. And yet I can be, totally guaranteed that my information uh, 
has not been like let out to that other hospital and that they haven't violated any laws and same for the other hospital. What's the key idea or is it or is it too difficult? <laughs> no, it's not too difficult. One of the beautiful things about about cryptography and also I should say the colleagues I've worked with is you can simulate down to to beautiful simple applications. I'll give you an example. I think one of the basic tenets is oblivious transfer. Okay? It's a beautiful oblivious. name. Yes, oblivious transfer. All it means, if we narrow it down to its absolute basic, is I can prepare two boxes for you, Russ. Okay, I would put one message for you in one box, another message for you in the other box, and you and I can have a conversation through which you pick exactly one of the two boxes, you open it up and you get the message, but I never get to see which box you picked. Ah. So that's the magic. You get an inst- I, I can give you two instructions, you would only pick one of them. I don't know which instruction you picked, and you don't know what I put in the other box. Gotcha. If okay. we do and that, we do that up- goes. Okay. Exactly. We do that a gazillion times, right? That's what computers are, you know, are, are brilliant at. I know that you have compared this to the very well-known game of 20 questions. Yeah, absolutely. That's one example. So I think it's the- like a series of boxes, this one or this one, this one or this Absolutely. one. Absolutely. But yeah. if you ask enough questions, you can go through those billions of data points relatively efficiently. Exactly. That's exactly what a computer allows you to do. Yeah, it's a, you can even think of it more, you know, another cool way to think of it is that boxes with keys. So I keep putting special keys for you and you keep opening just the one box and that allows you to open the next box. And in there, there's another thing for you and another key and another box. But I never get to see which boxes you pre- you pick. I only prepare all the boxes for you. You open all of them up. And yep. through the joint process of me preparing them for you and you opening just the right ones, we get to the answer, exact answer together. And you never know what I put in and I never know what you found out. Okay, so great. So that gives us a little bit of a nice intuition for how this works. What? Uh, and I know that you wrote a, a, an academic paper about it, but what's? when are we going to see this? Is this going to actually make it into implementation and into practice? Because then there will be a new kind of sigh of relief that there's an extra layer of security in genomic data. And I know that the privacy of genetic data, right or wrong, is a very big concern for everybody who I've spoken to who's thinking about getting their DNA tested at one of these companies or as part of a medical trial. So it's on people's minds. How far are we from an implemented system? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so as you know, we actually wrote three papers, two in the medical domain, I would mention, that show how to work with genomes without ever sharing them. The second one showed how to work with genomes and summations of your medical record, again, without ever sharing them. And the third paper we actually took to the criminal domain. Oh. So we showed how you can profile people, you know, just the, the work that police are doing every day. Again, you can search, you can canvas a neighborhood if you wanted, but you don't have to cache everybody's DNA in, right? So, so maybe I jumped a bit too far. So, so the bottom line, the, the point is there are multiple applications. The ones we, you know, in every one of these three papers, us, we perform real computations on real data in seconds and minutes. Yeah. And we make the code freely available. We don't patent it. We put it out there and we say, hey, you know, law enforcement agency, um, hospital silo, if you want to use this code, be our guest. So, so that's so, what we do. So it's interesting. So that means that that's an interesting statement because that tells me that even when you're absolutely transparent about the method, it still retains its security. Is that true? Absolutely. Yes. In other words, a bad guy can look at this code, but still won't be able to break into the information. So I'm asking, so, I'm asking. Yeah, that's a good question. So cryptographers have all these added layers. So to begin with, if you and I are absolutely honest about what we do, and I prepare the right boxes and you only open the correct box, it's, it's completely safe. Yes. And then cryptographers have built other layers of defense around that. What happens if there's a middleman in, in, you know, a third person in the middle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This goes beyond even my understanding as a genomicist. But there are all these layers of defense. So, so to a first approximation, it's safe. Okay. It's safe. It's pragmatic to use right now. We apply it to genomes and get answers within second to real genomes of real patients with real medical records. So, so the method is applicable now. How long before we see it used by society? 
that to us is above my pay grade. And unfortunately, you know, we all have places where we feel like we can contribute more or less. Yeah. I felt like as an academic, we should just be putting it out there and hope that society would, would pay attention and ultimately start using these tools. So, so I, I, and I hear you loud and clear, and you, you even said earlier that you're not a lawyer, but I'm going to press on that a little bit. So let's say that a hospital or a, or a healthcare system or a researcher wants to use the code. And as you said, there are legal processes in place that mandate privacy. There's going to be somebody who doesn't understand this technology who's going to say, well, wait a minute, how do I know? that for sure this is safe and that it delivers, that it delivers on the promise of security. And, I, and again, I know that, you know, the, the level of legal proof is not your expertise, but I'm sure you've thought about how do you convince a skeptical person that this code is going to be, do what you say it does and Absolutely. not have like bugs or holes in it that allow a bad guy to do something that you don't want them to do. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think the short answer to that, Russ, is just like we trust computers and the internet today with our credit card information, you know, with a lot of billing and a lot of money changing hands, right? Tons and tons of it. Um, there has been a process there as well, I think, where engineers and lawyers who understand engineering sat together and they gave a seal of, of you know, a proof, right? Yeah. A, a kosher seal or whatever for procedures. This, I imagine, is exactly what should be happening here. Gotcha. Got, so you could look to precedents in other areas and then just do like a copy on what they did. And then there's some confidence. Uh, very good. Well, OK, I want to move a little bit over to um, you mentioned very briefly that this is not just about genomic data. And I want to talk a little bit about your work with electronic health records, because anybody who goes to a doctor knows that the doctor spends at least as much time staring at the computer as staring at the patient. And <laughs> Separate from whether or not that's a good idea, there's no doubt that much of our, if not all of our medical data is in computers now. The initial reason for this is to take care of patients, but there are these secondary uses for discovery, for diagnosis of, of difficult to diagnose diseases. So tell me a little bit about your work in using electronic health records to kind of make discoveries in medicine and biology. Yeah, absolutely. So so, you know, the, the medical record, as you stated, Russ, because everything has moved to ASCII, you know, well, it's not really ASCII anymore, but whatever, everything is digital. Yes. You can apply code to people's medical records and ask over and over again, conceptually, can I do anything better for this person, right? You suddenly have, you can throw as much computation power into this. So, for example, one of the things we've done, maybe the first thing we've done, is we said, look, you know, one of the barriers to applying genomic medicine at scale is the genome comes as ACGs and Ts. You know, we've solved that. You, you throw it at the right machine, you get a bunch of ACGs and Ts, we can work with that. But what about the patient description, right? right. So A, if I ask for that's a highly, highly private issue, right? The notes between the doctor and the patients. And then we said, look, but we could use natural language processing tools to extract from the patient medical record just the phenotypes that they suffer from. Now, you said I, this word phenotype. I want to make sure we don't lose anybody. When you say a patient phenotype, what, what does that mean to a regular person? The signs and symptoms, anything that I suffer from. So, so if I have a child and my child has, you know, you, you, don't, get, you, you, are, you don't present to the doctor with a disease. You present to the doctors with a set of issues. Right. So this is my set of issues. I have an issue here and, you know, maybe it's my back and maybe it's my memory and maybe it's this and maybe it's that. I would like to get a set of issues that the patient suffers from in digital form in a way that does not have to tax the medical system at all. Uh -huh. For that, if I could read the clinical notes, it's all in there. This is exactly how my doctor leaves notes for themselves when they see me again, for other doctors and other clinicians who see me. It's all in there. Yes. So, so that was beautiful. You know, you don't have to go into card boxes, which you'd never go into. It's all digital. And the first thing we did was write code that goes through a person's entire medical record. This could be hundreds of thousands of words sometimes. Somebody has an elaborate history and tries to find the set of issues that the person suffers from. I and now see. you can very succinctly say, here's the person's genome, ACGs and Ts and all, and here's the person's set of issues. You know, this pain, that deformation maybe, this and that and that. What could it be in their genome that could explain their set of issues? Gotcha. Gotcha. And have these systems been built and do they work? 
Absolutely. So we have one, you know, you can play with it today if you like. We have one that we launched that's called amelie.stanford.edu. And that system doesn't only just take your medical record and your genome, it actually boots up every day. It reads all of yesterday's um, medical papers that were published in PubMed. Yes. Any one of them that it likes, it goes and gets the full text. It then parses the full text and it says, is there any new paper here that could explain anything about any of the patients in my system wow. that have not been solved today? So it's is alive. This, it's open to everybody in the world? Absolutely. So it's A-M-E-L-I-E dot Stanford dot E-D-U. Yeah. Like a famous movie, if you've seen it, about a certain lady called yes. Emily who was helping. Yeah. Yes. And also automated Mendelian literature evaluation. Right, of course. So what Amelie. would be what would be the question that somebody might have where they would go to Amelie to see if she she can give you an answer? <laughs> Absolutely. So so the question would be is here is my genome or my exome or all the genomic information I know about myself, and here are all the medical issues that I or, or somebody who you know who's this you know has this genome suffers from. Are there any medical papers out there that wow. could potentially explain my case? And if not. Would I be interested in providing my email address such that, you know, we show an example, we would have the system sit for two years on your genome, and then when the right paper gets published, you'd get one email from us that says, Russ, maybe this paper is relevant to you. One email in two years. And and could this be what, somebody who has, like, used one of these companies that does, uh, like, checks their DNA for, could they use that data to upload to this to this system? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, we'll have more with Gil Bajorano here on The Future of Everything on Sirius XM. This is The Future of Everything, and I'm Russ Altman. In the next segment, our conversation moves in a new direction, to the criminal justice system, which increasingly is using DNA evidence in tracking and convicting criminals. Welcome back to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman, and I continue my conversation with Professor Gil Bajorano about his work in cryptogenomics. In this segment, Gil tells us about his work with criminal justice data and why he is worried about disparities in how DNA is collected by police in the U.S. and globally. Also, he, we discuss ways we might address this unevenness. Interestingly, he believes that we can even make initial steps at the precinct level, individual precincts, who can now adopt technologies for how they analyze DNA that will still enable them to capture the bad guys, but maybe better protect the innocent. So Gil, one thing I know you've also worked on, and you made a, a, a quick reference to it in our previous part of our conversation, is the application of lots of these ideas to the criminal justice system. And that, again, is surprising to me because I know uh, most of your work traditionally has been in genetic discovery. Then you move to the privacy for patients and for DNA. Why, why does the criminal justice system come to your attention and what are you doing in that area? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so you know, like everybody, right, we went home uh, when Corona started, when COVID started. And then, right, we had the, the George Floyd case, I think, right? The, the, the pointless death of George Floyd really got us thinking. And we were thinking, you know, like, like I think many, many fellow Americans were thinking, I wish there was something I could do. And we got looking at, so, so what do I know? I know genomics and I know genetics. And we started asking, okay, what happens in the context of genetics and law enforcement? Mm -hmm. And what we saw us was that the law enforcement agencies were allowed effectively to collect genetic profiles of anybody they wanted. So in this country, we don't agree to have a genetic profile of everyone, you know, a blueprint for all of us. But the law enforcement agencies have the capabilities to take to take genomic data from anyone they want. And it appears from the media, right, this is a fairly opaque topic, from the media that they like using genetic information. So if there's, there's DNA in the crime scene, they would maybe canvas everybody they can put their hands on who yes. were at the area for the four hours before and after. Yes. Unfortunately, this leads to, to some kind of indiscrimination, right? Only people in certain segments, let's say, of geography uh, would get sampled. And when they get sampled, apparently, the samples live in the system indefinitely. Ah. So, so, so we said, wait, you know, there, there's, a, there's something that feels a bit about in, inequal here, right? Only people in certain times at certain places would get sampled. It's not, and, and the samples would live on forever. Couldn't this be done better through cryptography? 
So, so, so this is where we took our ideas from patients and we said, wait, we can search, right? So, so the, the tagline is, look, we want to use genomic information to canvas a whole neighborhood to find the one perpetrator. Because you still want to find the criminal. You're not saying exactly. that we shouldn't use this data. You're worried about the side effects of all the other people who are innocent, whose DNA might be dragged into a case for no real reason. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And we said, okay, A, is there a better way to do it, right? Can we search central databases without telling them the, the, the suspect's DNA, right? So it becomes very similar to the question I was asking before, yes. right? This is like, if I just grab somebody on the street and I get their permission, again, not a lawyer, if I get their DNA sample, can I search it against all of my database, find that they are, you know, they are not suspect at anything, and let them go. So if they are, you know, and the test I think cost about 40 bucks as we started reading more about it, right? So, so we preserve people's um, freedom and equality, if you like, equality, I should say, uh, in the face of, of um, genetic profiling. And I should also say, so, so that's like the first layer, right? The first layer is, can we both use genomics without targeting individual, targeting individual populations? Yes. Would that lead to better equality? I should also mention, I don't know that, you know, as a statement for life for us, I'm actually in favor of the system. I'm not sure that I'm not in favor of a system that just takes the DNA profile of all of us if that leads to a better life for all. It just felt like it was unequal and right. we wanted to make a statement about equality if you wanted to, to perform. So I do want to go back very early in this conversation. You said that the, uh, that the authorities can get DNA from anyone they want. And that's a pretty strong statement. So I want to understand what is the way in which uh, police or whatever get, get um, you, of course, when you arrest somebody, are there other, and, and then the second way you kind of inferred, you implied was when they go to a crime scene, they kind of swipe around the doorknobs and the glasses. So they're also collecting a lot of DNA for people who have not been arrested. And so, are, and I just want to make sure, is that the main ways that they get DNA or are there other ways that we should be aware of? Right. So, so this is where the lawyer in me is now quoting the New York Times and the Washington Post, right? Good, this is good. my level. So, so apparently you can do stop and spit um, stop uh, and spit, stop and spit. Uh, uh, activities anywhere you want. You would set up a roadblock perhaps, and you would stop people and you would offer them to spit into a tube if they agree. Wow. And if the person agrees to spit into the tube, there you go. You have the genetic profile. You can search for it. Again, I think in some sense, there's a very noble side to it, right? Right. You want to catch the bad guys. Right. Period. Right. But if you only ask a certain fraction of the population to spit into a tube, that is a bit of an inequality issue. And, and this is, okay, and then, and then jumping ahead, that's why you said a couple of seconds ago that part of you wonders if we should all be in a database so that there isn't this built-in uh, uh, kind of randomness of who's in the database based on whether they just were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, and, and so there's kind of an unfairness because I'm more likely to catch certain people than other people regardless of their kind of true innocence. Right, exactly. I think you're more likely to canvas people of certain socioeconomic backgrounds in, in tough neighborhoods. So, so I, yeah, so, so I guess the, the key question, similar to my question for healthcare, is how much traction have you gotten with law enforcement and criminal, criminal justice people with these ideas? Um, I'm guessing it's a slightly different audience. It is, and I am still waiting for the call. I don't know, you know, <laughs> I... Like I said, Russ, I, I often feel like I hit places where it's literally above my pay grade. So I'm delighted when the paper goes out, then the idea is out there for posterity, quote, quote unquote. Yes. And if society ever chooses to use it, it's there. It's not patented. We've computed it over real data. You know, you could search right. a database of millions of samples in seconds from the field. We've done all of that. So let, let's think about the rollout. Is this something that would have to be immediately adopted nationally? Or can you see a rollout plan where local jurisdictions could use it, like the California or, you know, or New York or Illinois, whatever? Um, uh, so when you think about this, does everybody have to be using it for it to be useful? Or do you think there could be a slower uptake of these kinds of technologies? Because everybody's going to like slow, I'm guessing, because then you can watch it, make sure nothing un unexpected happens, you know, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. The way I understand it, Russ, it could absolutely be a slow uptake. 
you can have one precinct decide that even when they want to check people out, they do not want to just cash everything they check. Can yeah, you feel uncomfortable about cash? cash? Tell me what you mean by cash. By cash, I mean currently... When you get anybody's DNA, you send them to the central repository, and whether they're to blame for anything or not, it stays there for prosperity. Gotcha. It just gets added, and those databases, I should say, they're at the national level, at the state level, and even at the city level. Different cities collect their own samples of DNA of select segments of their population. So you could have a single precinct say, you know what, let me try to do this differently. So now you have a very clear problem. You just have to walk to your local precinct, tell them, I'm Gil. You don't know me, but I have this great technology. You're welcome. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Either that, or I go national and say, hey, why don't we have a national repository of DNA, you know, right. information, right? Yeah. Well, Absolutely. thanks very much. Thanks for listening to The Future of Everything on Sirius XM. This is Russ Altman thanking Gil Bejarano, signing off. So there you have it. That was the future of cryptogenomics. You have been listening to The Future of Everything with Russ Altman on Sirius XM Business Radio, channel 132.